Okay, everybody, it is one o'clock by my clock. So we are gonna get started with our webinar today, brought to you by eGro, sponsored by BioWorks. We wanna thank you very much um, to BioWorks for sponsoring this webinar. Their sponsorship allows us to bring these webinars to you for free without any registration costs. So it is a, a big help to have sponsors like BioWorks. So today's webinar is titled Organic Fertilizers, Successfully Making the Switch. My name is Brian Krug. I'm from the University of New Hampshire. I uh, just want to welcome you here. We're very excited to have this, this webinar today. Our speakers will be Kim Williams from, the, from Kansas State University and Neil Matson from, the, from the Cornell University. Uh, without any further delay, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kim Williams from Kansas State University. Kim, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you okay. with, with your presentation. Okay. Well, so my role in the webinar today is to talk with you a little bit about um, challenges that are associated with making the switch from conventional to organic fertilizers but also to talk a little bit about reasons why you might want to consider doing it. So to start off the slide that you all see is just a quick reminder that organic fertilizers are, of course, derived from animal or vegetable matter, but we also have things like limestone and rock phosphate that are uh, OMRI listed and organic fertilizers. Next slide. So traditionally, pre-plant organic fertilizers included things like blood meal and bone meal, and these, of course, are still used today, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but there are other options today that we can use for organic fertilizers that can be incorporated pre plant Next slide. Next slide. So, um, Historically, we've had a number of liquid organic fertilizer sources that have been available to us, which include things like fish emulsions and fish hydrolysis and um, oilseed extract. And these uh, have some challenges with use, but certainly can be used to produce high quality plants. It is important to note that National Organic Program standards will allow up to 20% of the nitrogen formed from sodium nitrate. And so that can allow some organic fertilizer liquid blend uh, to include uh, some nitrate in the nitrogen form mix. Next slide. So an important idea as we think about switching from conventional to organic nutrient sources is that we really have to be aware of the availability of the nutrients in the fertilizer. There are going to be some immediately available, like can be immediately absorbed by the roots. Um, nutrient forms, and then there are going to be some slow release components. And that is true from, for both conventional and organic. So with something like 2010-20 soluble feed in our conventional nutrient um, supply, all of those nutrients, when they're applied to the irrigation stream, are readily absorbed by the plant roots. With organic fertilizers, this is not always the case, uh, because the nutrients are released more slowly through decomposition and microbial activity. However, a lot of organic fertilizers have a really high initial um, salt release that we have to be aware of when we're designing their use in our fertilizer program. Of course, we have slow release nutrient sources on the conventional side too, like um, krill coated fertilizers, uh, like Osmocote, and some challenges associated with their use include things like the prill coatings being compromised at high production temperatures, which can result in some nutrient dumping and high salt levels building up in our substrates at that, at that time. Next slide. So as we think about then how we can use organic fertilizers in our production system, um, traditionally when we were thinking of, about pre-plant incorporating organics, we were looking at pre-planting products like feather meal, blood meal, and bone meal, um, and other compost. And a challenge with this in terms of doing it um, season after season is that 
a lot of times the batches of nutrients would change from year to year and source to source, which would make it more difficult to, over time, develop a system that could be replicated and um, um, optimized. Today we have available to us a number of, of engineered organic fertilizers, which are manufactured from a variety of inputs, and they are manufactured in a way so that the source materials are consistent from batch to batch, and the um, materials themselves are, are processed in using consistent and repeatable practices, which make them a lot more reliable from batch to batch and from season to season and year to year as we use them. So what we learn with one crop, we can count on being um, transferable to the next. Next slide. So in addition to OMRI listed organic fertilizers, some of these um, um, engineered organic fertilizers also contain mineral nutrients as well. So we have a few examples on this slide here, which include um, Verdanta GM2. And as you can see, it has organic components like hoof and horn meal and fermented sugar beet molasses, um, poultry manure, and cocoa shell meal, but also inorganic salts like monoammonium phosphate and potassium nitrate. They're going to be um, rapidly uh, released once the uh, fertilizer is incorporated or top dressed into the substrate and immediately available to support plant growth, but then the organic components are going to provide a, a slow release, a nutrient source. We can also consider something like sustain, which is on the organic side, aerobically composted turkey litter, but then also has a SUMA coat, a polymer coated urea, potassium nitrate, and monoammonium phosphate. And so, um, and, and we can even look at a liquid source like Nature Source 1043, which is an oil seed extract that, to increase the nitrogen concentration, also has some organic nutrient salt. So there are several examples of engineered organomineral fertilizers on the market today, which includes sort of the best of both worlds, some organic and some inorganic, to um, optimize nutrition needs across a wide range of production scenarios. Next slide. So why would we want to consider something that was a combo organomineral fertilizer? Well, one reason would be that there's the environmental benefit of keeping some of these byproducts um, from like food processing uh, waste streams out of uh, our environment. They can be more cost effective than sol solely using organic fertilizers. Uh, the organic derived materials do promote beneficial microbes, so, there, so uh, by having the organic component in the fertilizer program, there's the opportunity to promote a really healthy microbial community in the substrate. And very importantly, you get blended nutrient release, where you have a combination of readily available and then slowly available nutrient release that um, can can match, more readily match plant need over the course of production cycle, which could reduce nutrient release, nutrient leaching over, uh, over production. Next slide. So regarding the nutrient release, need, reduce nutrient leaching idea, here's a, bit, a little bit of research that we did with some of Verdanta fertilizers in growing Bravo Bright Red Poinsettia which are certainly a, a high fertility crop. So you kind of get an overview of how the plants look. And uh, the two on top represent uh, conventional controls of 175 parts per million nitrogen coming constant liquid feed from 2010-20 and uh, conventional slow release osmocote. And then if you look at the three plants on the bottom left, we have um, EcoVita um, with uh, sometimes with GM2 and sometimes top dress. And then on the next slide, you'll be able to see the um, nitrogen release profile from these fertilizers. We'll go to the next slide. And you see on the um, y-axis that we're, look, we're measuring the amount of nitrogen that's coming through uh, the, the pot over the course of the production cycle. 
and that orange line represents the commercial con the, the conventional control of 175 parts per million nitrogen. You can see that the amount of nutrients that are leached from this treatment really do build to quite excessive levels. So uh, that great growth does come at a cost of a lot of loss of fertilizer and some impact on it when it's applied in this way. But when we strategize with our organo combo, uh, our organo uh, mineral nutrient sources, we can even out that nutrient release profile quite a bit and still get quite good growth. Next slide. So an important thing to keep in mind as we start using organic fertilizers in our nutrition program is that whatever environmental conditions favor microbial activity is going to hasten nutrient release from the organic fertilizer source. So things like um, warm temperatures, which are going to speed up the rate of, of microbial breakdown of the organic matter, will speed nutrient release. It'll be important to not have um, waterlogged substrates or uh, pHs that are, are too low because these are also um, factors that will slow microbial activity and thus reduce um, nutrient release from, from organic nutrient sources. Next slide. So this is a spot where we were going to get some input from you guys about what you consider your barriers to switching to organic fertilizers. Um, Brian, do you want to, there we are, your barriers to switching to organic. If you could um, select any of these items that strike you as as being a problem, something that's keeping you from making the switch, please let us know and we'll see what the uh, input is from the audience here. Yeah, I like Daniel's comment about, yeah, all of them. It's so true. There are a lot of things that we have to consider as we're uh, looking at incorporating organics into our nutrient management program. So Brian has put the results up for us here, and it looks like there's a pretty close tie. About half of us are challenged with finding products that work, and half of us just knowing how to use them and uh, what rates and how to apply. Um, uh, it's interesting to see that only 6% of our audience responded with labor uh, or uses being a, being a concern. So that's, that's good news. Um, and actually, we've got some information coming up as the webinar progresses about how to use and rates to apply that we hope that you'll find helpful. Next slide. So let's talk about some of the difficulties with using organic fertilizers. And we've already alluded to some of these. And one can be high initial EC, depending on the organic nutrient source. And, and we might have to adjust our production strategies to deal with that. Another can be slow nutrient release, especially with longer term crops. We're not getting nutrient release fast enough via the organic method. Managing pH of the substrate can be a challenge because of the um, nitrogen forms that we're dealing with with organic. And then uh, a, a routine challenge that um, we hear and experience ourselves with organic fertilizers is being able to provide a comparable level of nutrients as conventional fertilizers. Um, ratio of nutrient supply is also an issue. And uh, actually, in the next slide, I can uh, show you a little bit of research with that where we can take a look at how um, different N, P205, and K2O ratios can influence plant architecture. So while that slide is coming up, Brian, I see there's a question um, about what EC is. EC stands for electrical conductivity, and it's an overall measure of the amount of soluble salt, or we can say fertilizers, in the substrate. So EC is a really nice overview of the total amount of, of fertilizer, um, plus any salts that are coming, for example, from the water source in the um, substrate. So with this slide, you see an experiment that we did 
with uh, poinsettias and we use uh, liquid organic nutrient sources that have, as you can see, a range of N P205 and P20 ratios. And if I could point out the difference that we get in plant architecture from the fish emulsion, which had a, a 511 nutrient formulation, you can see it's much more columnar uh, and less uh, sort of uh, uh, wide in terms of its plant architecture. And that's, um, you know, that can be a challenge to get the, the um, plant architecture we want based on getting a ratio of nutrients uh, from our organic nutrient sources that we're familiar with and used to working with with conventional sources. Next slide. So the bottom line for Neil and I is that while there are a lot of benefits of using organics, we are still working to optimize using the organic fertilizers uh, available um, to offer the same amount of control and flexibility as conventional fertilizers. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get fantastic plant growth with organic, because as you'll see from our research results, you certainly can. It's just that um, we we sort of have built into our mindset and our um, our modes of operation, how we can get control and flexibility, which we're used to as conventionals, and we kind of have to change the way we think about it in using and incorporating organic fertilizers into our nutrient management programs. Next slide. So as you think about making the switch from conventional to organic, a very important place to start is evaluating all of the aspects of your nutrient management program making sure you've got a recent water quality report to uh, take a look at what micronutrients are provided and what your alkalinity and salt levels are in your irrigation source. Making sure that your nutrient management is interfacing appropriately with how you irrigate and the root medium that you're choosing to use. And then of course you're layering in your fertilizer program. Because, and this is a really important point, you've got to ensure that all of your essential plant nutrients are provided in the appropriate amount. Next slide. It seems like such a simple thing to say, such an obvious thing, but it's something that we can really get um, tripped up on. And here's an example um, of, from, from my own work in terms of learning the hard way. I worked with a grower for several years who routinely had problems with calibrachoa um, showing symptoms of iron deficiency late in the production season. And because I knew that she was on a, a well in the Midwest and had high alkalinity in her water, uh, in our conversations I always emphasized that she needed to be really careful about not letting the pH drift upward over the course of the production season. And she continued to make changes in her overall nutrient management program that resulted in management of the substrate pH. And uh, it was after the point where she said, you know, I'm, I'm doing all those things and I'm still seeing this iron deficiency on my caliber color late in the season. So we took a, a visit to her greenhouse and um, sure enough when we measured the pH and you see in her substrate it was right where it needed to be and it, it certainly we couldn't pin the problem on, um, on lack of, of pH management of the irrigation water in the substrate any longer. So uh, if you click advance, we'll see a closer look at her fertilizer. So not the next, there you go, thanks Brian. So we found that she was, you know, we knew that she was using the uh, 1043 um, organomineral fertilizer and it had an iron content of 0.01%. So was that enough? Next, uh, advanced, Brian. So we took some of our plants back to our greenhouses at K-State and um, just applied iron chelate. So the substrate pH was fine, but just by providing the supplemental iron, found that indeed the problem wasn't that the pH of the substrate was off, but simply that the nutrient source that she was relying on, while it had some iron, it just didn't have enough to meet this crop's needs, especially as the season progressed. So it was just a reminder that we have to pay really close attention to where all of our essential nutrients are coming from and make sure that they're provided in adequate quantity. Next slide. So in switching from conventional to organic, it's, it's really important 
to be committed. In other words, you have to be prepared to intensively manage your fertilizer program over the course of the production cycle. Maybe taking more pH, EC, and even iron-specific measurements, nutrient measurements than you used to. The reason that iron-specific measurements become important with organic nutrient sources is that a lot of times there are um, elements like sodium that are kind of along for the ride in some um, organic nutrient sources that are contributing to overall EC. So we can't be quite as confident that the uh, overall salt levels that we're measuring is all fertilizer. But if we can use some new, some, some new tools that are available to us to look at, at specific ions, like ammonium or nitrate or potassium, then we can be very confident about developing a, a history of information for our crop production process that relates specifically to fertilizer availability, nutrient availability. Another important idea is that before you would want to go all out with um, adopting an organic or organomineral fertilizer program, you should plan into your production small runs of several cultivars um, that, and also still have your current practice as a control so that you can get a handle on what the differences are going to be with this significant change in the nutrient management program. Next slide. So there's no question that the challenges can be overcome to produce healthy, vigorous plants with using organic or organomineral fertilizers. And um, we're going to show you a few strategies from our research that uh, might help mitigate or navigate these challenges associated with your use. Next slide. One of the most important things to decide uh, in, in starting to use the, um, the organic or organomineral fertilizers is by noting the length of the cropping cycle because it's definitely much easier to use them with crops that have shorter cropping cycles. Uh, the manufacturer of especially the engineered um, organic fertilizers will uh, provide an estimate of the nutrient release. And pre-plant incorporation is going to work really well for many short-term crops that would turn in, say, four weeks. But as the crop production cycle lengthens, then you, you would need to start thinking about strategies to get additional nutrients to the crop after the pre-plant uh, amended nutrient supply is expired. Next slide. So if we look at some examples of that, Anil has some work with basal plus. At, um, from Cornell, where you can see the no fertilizer control on the left, then a sustained 844 preplant incorporated at 8 pounds per cubic yard, compared to a conventional control of 2020 from, uh, with 100 parts per million nitrogen three times per week. The next slide shows some close ups of the, the plugs, and you can see that the sustain at the preplant incorporation. Um, really grows uh, fine quality plugs and keeping in mind that this is a four week production cycle, again suggests that with that length of production cycle you're going to be able to meet all of the crop nutrient needs with the pre plant incorporation. Next slide. Similarly, we found at K-State that with, um, with tomato transplant production, um, if, you, if you see on the sort of bottom row there, there's an asterisk. Um, and that's between the, the rates of Verdanta GM2 that resulted in um, high quality uh, transplant growth that was um, quite good compared to the commercial control which was, was represented on the, the far left. But a, a rate of like six and a half to eight pounds of the GM2 preplant met all of the needs of the uh, tomato transplant. These were grown for five weeks. Next slide. So as the length of the cropping cycle extends, um, as, as crops that, that are going to take longer than just four to six weeks to produce, um, the, the strategy there would be to supplement the nutrients uh, that are added pre-plant for these longer term crops. And this can be done either by top dressing or by um, uh, adding in liquid feed uh, say four weeks into the production cycle. Next slide. 
So here's an example of a 15-week garden mom where uh, we've got the control, this heavy feeding crop at 250 parts per million nitrogen on the left versus uh, all of the uh, nutrients provided from Ecovita at a rate of 8 pounds per, per cubic yard on the right. So a smaller plant, but we can supplement the nutrients um, a month or you know five weeks into the production cycle to get the same sort of growth that we're seeing on the left. Next slide. So for example, here we have um, pre-planned organic and then supplemental conventional liquid feed added in. And um, what you can see on the left, on both the top and bottom rows, is the control. 175 parts per million nitrogen from 2020. And then if we the growth that we can get if we start supplementing four weeks into the production cycle with 100 parts per million nitrogen from either 2020 or 13 to 13, we get growth that's um, um, quite comparable to the, the conventional standard. But if you see that middle plant on the bottom row, uh, we started supplementing with that treatment seven weeks into the production cycle. And you can see the huge difference that delaying those three weeks really made in terms of, of uh, finished plant size. So the challenge is keeping an eye on the nutrient levels as the production cycle is progressing, and then jumping in with some supplemental feed as the pre-plant um, nutrient addition starts to fade. So the next slide takes us back to um, the nutrient release that we had taken a peek at earlier in the presentation. Before I talk a bit about this, I just wanted to answer a question that popped up, which was asking about when I say pre-plant, do I mean incorporation of the nutrients before planting? And yes, that's exactly what, we, what we're talking about there. Um, there's a question about uh, whether or not Top dressing can result in, in um, damage to the stem. Um, it, it, well, let me talk about that a little bit later because that's not actually what we did with the data that we have in front of us now. So uh, in this slide, again, we just see our ammonium and nitrate levels on the x-axis plotted over the course of the production cycle. And again, that orange line is, is the amount of nitrogen that uh, coming out of the bottom of the pot, if at, at a constant liquid feed strategy, we're applying 175 parts per million nitrogen. And you can see that it builds to quite excessive levels. But those two lines in the middle of the graph, which are um, treatments 10 and 11, uh, are the plants that we just, are from the plants that we just looked at, where we have really good growth, where we started supplementing uh, after pre plant Eco Vita and GM2 four weeks into the production cycle, adding just 100 parts per million nitrogen from either 2020 or 13 to 13. If we waited seven weeks, it was too late to get a really high quality finished plant growth. Next slide. Okay, so one problem that can occur with uh, some types of, of organic fertilizers is really high initial salt level. And um, that can especially happen with pre-plant incorporation of raw organic materials like feather meal and blood meal. So, um, you know, especially when we're, we're transplanting plugs or tender seedlings that just can't withstand uh, very high salt levels, we have to be aware of the initial uh, nutrient release that we're going to get from these components. So we'll talk about a few strategies to deal with that. The next slide, we can see some research with impatience. And in this case, all of the nutrients that the plant receives for their production cycle were incorporated pre-plant. We had an osmocote conventional control, and then feather meal and blood meal. And what we saw was very high EC levels from the feather meal and blood meal treatment, which is you know, not surprising, uh, but those EC levels reached the four to five range. Now, if we just did 
one good irrigation, so we watered the, the pots in and then did one good irrigation before we transplanted the impatience plugs into the pot. And that's what you can see actually with the star on the x-axis of this graph, that's where the irrigation occurred. You can see how that the leaching event reduced the salt levels in the pot so that when the impatience plugs were transplanted, they weren't subjected to uh, any C of you know, 4 to 5, but it was down in the 3 range and they did fine. So the plants that you see grown, or the plants that you see in this slide were actually grown with all of the nutrients pre-planted. It's just that they had one leaching event before the plugs were transplanted into the pot. And that's a way to deal with uh, high EC levels that can come from um, some organic nutrient sources. Next slide. Another strategy would be to top dress at mid-crop. And um, this is actually related to the, the um, question that we just had about how to top dress. So it's, it's generally not a good idea to put a full strength fertilizer or even something like, you know, uh, uh, plastic encapsulated prills of conventional fertilizers right up next against plant stem. But when a top dress occurs, of any type of fertilizer to just avoid the area right around the stem and make sure that the uh, nutrients or the, the fertilizers are well distributed across the surface of the substrate away from the stem and can be uh, a way to bump nutrition into the production cycle after the pre-plant charge is um, fading. So this slide just shows some, some work where we could look at Verdanta GM2 which remember from one of the earlier slides, has those soluble inorganic nutrient sources in this organomineral fertilizer. So this is not recommended by the supplier. If you put all of the, the uh, nutrients that the crop would need for its entire production cycle in pre-plant, then the salt level builds too high. We were reading about 10 decibels per meter um, with the plants on the left. With the plants on the right, though, we just simply put half of the crop um, nutrient needs mixed into the substrate before planting, and then we applied the remaining nutrients that the crop needed halfway through the production cycle at day 45. And you can see that the uh, difference is significant, and it's all about managing the EC in the substrate. So the nutrient needs of the plants were met by separating the applications of the organic nutrients. Next slide. And then the third strategy that we offer is combining organic and inorganic slow release. So by doing this, we can minimize high initial EC from large doses of some organic sources. And at the same time, we can abate, we can abate uh, the dumping of nutrients from plastic encapsulated curls, which can occur when production temperatures get quite high. This is not an uncommon problem with um, fall mum production, for example. An advantage of using both organic and inorganic slow release is that we've got our nitrogen coming from both ammonium and nitrate nitrogen forms. And with the organic matter in our substrate from our organic nutrient source, we're establishing diverse and healthy mi microbial communities that can also help um, fight some uh, root diseases just by virtue of their presence and being able to outcompete a uh, pathogenic microbe that might um, come into the system. Next slide. So here's an example of some work along those lines where uh, we looked at using sustained plus uh, conventional slow-release fertilizer versus just a, a higher rate of uh, Osmocote um, pre-plant incorporated across the board. Next slide. So with that, I'm now eager to turn the mic over to Neil, and he's got a lot of research results to show you with regard to how to optimize use of organic and organomineral fertilizers in your nutrient management program. All right, thank you, Kim. Uh, again, I apologize for, for a little bit of technical difficulties here, but uh, um, we're, we're um, moving through them. 
Um, there was a question, um, if, if there would be time at the end of the, the webinar to ask questions to the speakers, and yes, we will have some time at the very end. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to introduce Neil Matson from the University of, or I'm sorry, from Cornell University. Um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Neil. And Neil, I'm going to attempt to sh um, give Good you control of the computer and see if it works for you. Okay, we shall see. Um, I can click on show my screen. Fantastic. So that bodes well. Um, let's see. I don't see the slides per se, Brian. Do you have them? You need to... Uh, oh, I need to load them. Yep, there you go. <laughs> okay, how's that? Perfect. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a sunny but very cold day in central New York, so a good day to talk about growing plants. Uh, and that's a nice segue into uh, one, of the, one of the things I wanted to mention related to using organic fertilizers is that we do find that there is an effect between uh, temperature and um, nutrient avail availability and growth of plants. And so uh, we did a trial at Cornell where we had uh, tomato transplants. We actually had them at three different temperatures at 50 degrees um, and uh, 60 and 68 degrees. And we grew them with four different um, organic fertilizers that we incorporated into the potting mix, all at the same rate of nitrogen. So they all vary in their percent nitrogen but we included it at about 0.4 pounds of nitrogen per cubic yard. And the materials we used were worm power vermicompost, um, microstart, uh, verdanta, and sustain. And then we had two conventional controls. So those were osmocote as well as a constant liquid feed um, at 150 parts per million with a 2010-20 liquid fertilizer. Uh, so we found that the at 60 degrees and then at 68 degrees, which is pictured at the top of the slide here, the um, organic granular fertilizers performed pretty well, especially in the case of microstart, verdant, and sustain, uh, compared to the uh, osmocote uh, control alternative. Uh, but when we got down to 50 degrees, um, and remember Kim mentioned that nutrient release really depends on microbial activity. So at cooler temperatures, um, we both have uh, lower plant growth, but we also have lower microbial activity as well. So we did see that there was difference then in performance of the organic fertilizers. And so that makes us think that in a minimally heated greenhouse in the wintertime, um, it's going to be more difficult to use organic fertilizers than in one where you're paying to, to heat it to um, 60 degrees or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, now I wanted to mention a bunch of kind of case studies of using some different organic fertilizer materials and combining some different materials. And one of the things that we've done a lot of research in at Cornell is honing in on different um, rates to use. And um, as Kim mentioned, I really recommend conducting your own small scale trials as well. Um, make sure that you have a decent number of plants so as to be representative um, and also include a control as well. And we've combined this with routine monitoring uh, pH and electrical conductivity or measure of salts, and then um, visual observations of shoot and root quality and development as well. Uh, one of the studies that we did was looking at the sustain the poultry litter based material um, incorporated into a potting mix prior to transplanting plugs, um, and we used it at uh, rates of 0, 5, 10, 15, and 20 pounds <clears throat> of material per cubic yard. Uh, and so with peppers, which is a lighter feeder, we found that five pounds per cubic yard was sufficient for optimal growth of the plant and any further addition did not buy us really any benefit in terms of plant growth. Uh, but then we looked at tomato, which was a heavier feeder, and we found uh, between 10 to 20 pounds per cubic yard. And actually at about 10 pounds per cubic yard, we saw um, the highest growth with no, not much further increase in growth. Um, an interesting thing is even though we had vigorous plants, we did see a bit of nitrogen deficiency um, on those plants, which and I'll get to talk more about finding um, uh, liquid fertilizers that can work in complement with some of these um, solids that are incorporated into the potting mix. Uh, when we, we uh, did weekly measurements of pH and EC, and the chart in front of you is, is pH um, averaged over that six-week production period, 
Uh, and we find that a lot of the granular organic materials are basic in nature, so they have a, a slightly elevated pH. And then the more that you, you use those materials, the more you're going to elevate the pH of your potting mix. So when applied at 10 pounds per cubic yard, our pH was about perfect over that six week period, uh, was about six. Uh, but when we used at that, those higher rates, the 15 and 20 pounds per cubic yard, uh, the pH was high. And with some of our uh, more sensitive plants to iron deficiency, such as petunia um, and peppers in the vegetable world, we would have seen iron deficiency in those crops. So one thing you can take into account is if you know the pH effect of your organic fertilizer. Uh, if you're mixing your own potting mix, you can reduce the limestone rate that you use uh, so that um, you can then rely on the organic fertilizer to raise the pH. Um, and then this shows the EC or the total salts uh, from a pour through measurement over that six week period of time. Um, and the, the top bar is at 20 pounds per cubic yard rate. And the bottom bar is the uh, the zero pounds per cubic yard rate. And let's see, Connie says no image. Is anyone else having problems seeing the slides? Just let me know if you do. Okay, so what we found um, in monitoring, monitoring EC is that um, as that fertilizer is getting consumed over time, so it's being um, released by microbes and being absorbed by the plant, it can also leach out of the container as well. We found that after about four or five weeks of growing plants that the fertilizer was gone. So for this particular product, um, it has a six week release period, but that is a very temperature dependent process. Um, and so in this case, um, if we needed to grow the transplants for longer, we should have uh, top dressed or reapplied some fertilizer or started using liquid fertilizer at that point uh, to make sure that we continue to feed the plants. Um, looking again at release rates and comparing different materials to each other, um, we did a study, in this case, um, growing some ornamental plants, some, some bedding plants, using four different uh, uh, substrate incorporated materials. In this case, there were three organic materials. They were EcoVita, which is a 7510 material. Um, it has a release period of 75 to 100 days. Um, MicroStart 60 Plus uh, by the Purdue Poultry Company is a 772 material. Um, it does not have a label release period. Uh, and then Sustain 844 has a 45 day release period. We wanted to compare that to Osmocote Bloom, which is a conventional cold, controlled release fertilizer with a two to three month release period. And that was a 12718 material. So again, we wanted to apply these materials at kind of a medium label rate. So we picked a rate that would give us the same pounds of nitrogen per cubic yard. So honing in on 0.42 pounds of nitrogen per cubic yard. Uh, the two additional treatments we had were a clear water just to see what plants look like with no fertilizer. And I always like to include that as a control because it shows you what's, uh, what's in your potting mix and how well the plants can grow without fertilizer. And then we had a liquid 21520 uh, that was applied every weekday during watering at 150 parts per million nitrogen. So you can see with the materials, we applied them with the granular materials at rates of 3.5 to 6 pounds per cubic yard, uh, depending on their nitrogen content. And I'll show you um, three different pictures that look like this. Um, these were the, the coleus that we grew. Um, it was stained glassworks umpa was the cultivar. Uh, so we transplanted it and grew it for five weeks. Uh, you can see in the top left what the unfertilized plant looks like, and then uh, in the middle next to that was the 21520 um, uh, constant liquid feed, uh, then the Osmocote and the EcoVita micro start and sustain. And with coleus, sort of a medium uh, fertility plant, um, you'll notice that the uh, substrate incorporated fertilizers did not give us quite the same degree of vigorous growth as the liquid fertilizer, uh, but still a very acceptable plant form. Um, and in some cases, like the EcoVita uh, plant uh, looked like a nice compact uh, plant that was well branched. Um, so in some cases, you can think about when you supply adequate fertility, but not excessive fertility, uh, then you can use less um, plant growth regulators. So that can be um, one advantage of them. Um, these were uh, the pansies in our trial. And in this case, it was only a, a four week crop. Uh, we saw 
with the Osma coat, the micro start and the sustained plant size was, was pretty similar to our liquid fed control. Um, size was a, a little bit off with the EcoVita treatment and our thought here is um, it does have a longer release period. It, it was at 75 to 100 day release period and so we believe that uh, because this was only a four week crop, uh, the plant only had access to say half of that fertilizer. Um, so uh, we want to do some follow up experiments looking at um, some additional rates. Um, one thing with the longer term release product is you can think about uh, the retail shelf life of plants. If they go to a retail environment where they're not fertilized or if they go to the consumer's home and we all know that consumers uh, do not always um, fertilize to the degree that they should once the, the plants are in their own home environment. Um, if we have a material that has uh, some residual fertilizer uh, left to release, that that can be a value added thing uh, for the consumer. Um, and then with Petunia, Petunia was really um, a heavy feeder um, and we were not able to get uh, plants of the same size using any of the, the uh, substrate incorporated materials as we did with our liquid fed um, plant. And so again, we can think of higher rates here. Um, the other thing that we could do is use substrate incorporated organics as our base fertilizer. And then for our lighter feeders and more moderate feeders, that may be enough for short term crops, uh, but then we may need to supplement um, in the organic world with liquid organics or in the conventional world with a conventional liquid uh, to boost growth of those um, higher fertility plants. Um, so one question for the audience and Brian, I don't know if uh, because I have the slides, I don't know if we'll be able to pull the audience. Um, we wanted to see if any of you have been using vermicompost as an organic nutrient source. Um, okay, so apparently Brian has opened the poll. Organizer must, uh, okay. So, are any of you able to see the poll and answer? Yes, they're, they're answering it. I'm just giving them a few seconds to uh, get everything in. We've got about 65% of the people voted right now. Excellent. And you'll have to let us know at the end if you like the interactivity involved. Maybe in future webinars we can do more like a quiz show type of thing and uh, that'd be a great way to add that interactivity. So then Brian, um, let me know briefly what the audience answered. Okay, so we have about 40% say no, and 40% are saying no, but interested in trying. 18% mm -hmm. said yes, but they don't use it routinely. And then 4% are saying yes and use routinely. Excellent, thanks for all of your responses, everyone. Okay, and then my screen should be showing again. Um, we've done about three years worth of research at Cornell University comparing different um, vermicompost sources. Um, and uh, we've been looking at them for growing, especially vegetable and herb transplants, but also for ornamental crops as well. Um, and one of the things we like about um, vermicompost <clears throat> as opposed to a conventional compost <coughs> that it typically does have a higher fertility value associated with, with it than compost. Um, the additional processing by the worms uh, further fragments the compost uh, and gives you uh, a higher uh, availability of nutrients as well as the microbe community associated with the worms helps to um, convert organically bound nutrients into plant available nutrients. Um, we have heard that there are a lot of different experiences with vermicompost. So we did one trial where we wanted to compare four different commercially available vermicomposts. Uh, so we used uh, Vital Earth, the Verma Technology, and then the bottom two, Terravesco and Worm Power. Those were both um, dairy manure solids based um, vermicomposts. We used a peat perlite potting mix, and then we used vermicompost to displace some of the peat at zero, two and a half, five, ten, or twenty percent by volume and we grew uh, tomato and uh, pepper transplants in the mix. And um, this is the a nutrient comparison just of the vermicompost materials themselves um, on a dry weight basis. And an interesting thing to us is that they were very variable. So the vital earth had a pH of 4.1. The other vermicompost materials had a higher pH, um, seven plus. 
Um, in terms of soluble salts, the first two materials had quite low soluble salts, our EC, uh, but the Terravesco and the worm power and the dairy manure based uh, materials had higher ECs. Um, and then when we look at their total NP and K, um, it was a similar story with the Terravesco and the worm power having higher uh, plant available nutrients and, and higher total NP and K as well. Um, so that could be a, a whole different webinar at some point, um, talking about some of the differences between vermicompost. But I wanted to show you um, uh, how the plants looked. So this is fresh weight of those plants after growing them um, for five weeks. Uh, so the interesting thing is that the worm power and the Terravesco um, were the performed the best. So we saw nice increases in plant growth the more that we used uh, those materials. Um, and in terms of a commercially acceptable plant, we found about 5% uh, by volume worm power gave us a commercially acceptable plant, um, or about 10 or 20% by volume of the Terravesco. But the Vital Earth and the Vermitechnology materials, um, they're fine as a substrate replacement for um, peat, but we can't rely on them to provide um, all of the fertilizer needs of the tomato transplants in this particular experiment. Uh, I'll show you a few pictures here. The back row is the worm power plants at 0, 2.5, 5, 10, and 20 percent by volume. And then um, Vital Earth is um, toward your front. Um, and that's at 2.5, 5, 10, and 20 percent by volume. Uh, then a very similar picture, but with the Verma technology in front. Um, and again, with um, this one is with the Terravesco in the front and the worm power in the back. So one of our thoughts related to using vermicompost um, and maybe similar to using to using any other material is it's very important to um, to work with the supplier to determine you know what are the suitable uses for it. Um, is it a is it uh, does it have decent fertility associated with it? In this case, like the worm power or the Terravesco materials, um, or is it more of, uh, suitable as a substrate amendment but does not have a high um, fertility value associated with it. Um, and I did see a question related to top dressing of vermicompost. And yes, we have found some nice results top dressing with vermicompost. Uh, and um, with the worm power vermicompost, it's a very fertile vermicompost. But again, the fertilizer release period only lasts three or four weeks. So we've had good results um, top dressing with the material after that three to four weeks. We've also found good results uh, with it where we top dress um, germinating seedlings about a week or two after um, they've started to germinate. Um, and we're continuing on work with vermicompost, looking at combining vermicompost along with other organic fertility sources. And we think that there are some benefits from the microbe community in vermicompost in terms of facilitating nutrient transfer from the other organic fertilizer sources. So look for more information to come in the future related to that. Uh, then let me talk uh, uh, briefly about uh, using granular and liquid organic materials together. Uh, so we've, uh, we did one trial with sustained 844 as our base heat that was applied at eight pounds per cubic yard. And then we used some different liquid fertilizers at 100 parts per million nitrogen um, applied just three times per week. And then we looked at combining both of them together. So here's one example with four inch tomato transplants. Uh, and so we have the control plant, the sustain only plant, um, in this case a conventional 20-10-20, and then the sustain plus the 20-10-20 gave us a larger plant. Um, then looking at a couple of the different organic uh, liquids, um, we use Nature Source 311, so the uh, seed oil extract and found that um, combined with sustain, we got a, a plant that was larger than either of the two um, individually. Um, and then we, we've used some of the different um, fish-based materials. This one was DRAM1, um, and it was effective as uh, for fertilizing, um, but plant size was not the same as our nature source plants, as you see um, again in this slide. Um, so there is some variability, even though we applied them at the same amount of nitrogen, the liquid materials vary in how much of that is readily available versus how much of that is an organic um, slow release. Um, and then uh, we've done a bit of work with um, EcoVita as our uh, base. Um, 
so a, a 7% granular organic um, and then combined with different um, liquid feeds. And so uh, I'll show just a few pictures here. Um, so we have uh, pansies on the, the top. Uh, we have 100 parts per million conventional 20-10-20 um, daily. Um, and then on the right, 200 parts per million 20-10-20 daily. Then on the bottom were a couple of our EcoVita treatments. So they got four pounds per cubic yard EcoVita as um, their base feed. And then we did a once weekly drench on the lower left that was with a liquid conventional, the 20-10-20. Um, and then on the bottom right, that was with uh, liquid um, PL2, which is also a, a BioWorks um, Verdanta material. That one's a liquid material that we applied at 200 parts per million and weekly. Um, and you can see that we have uh, very similar size um, when, we, when we were doing the um, once weekly drench at 200 parts per million with a liquid. We had similar results to the conventionally grown plants. Here's petunias after four weeks with the same fertilizer treatments. Um, and Kim talked a little bit about plant form related to using organic fertilizers. Um, it's interesting if you look at the lower right, um, the combination of EcoVita with uh, the PL2 liquid organic, we saw very nice um, branching and a more compact uh, plant with that particular treatment. And then here are tomatoes. So again, that four pounds per cubic yard is the base with the once weekly drench of either the, the conventional or the organic liquid. We saw very nice sized dirty plants. Um, and then we've been starting to work with herbs as well. So this is lavender after six weeks. Um, and we have the control of the unfertilized plant on the left. We have EcoVita um, incorporated prior to transplanting at six pounds per cubic yard. Um, and then the plant on the right is EcoVita um, plus twice weekly um, PL2 liquid at 100 parts per million nitrogen. Um, and that gave us the largest size uh, plant. So with that, we're um, rapidly running out of time here, I guess, for our webinar. Let me mention a summary of some of the, some of the successes that we found. Um, and that are many different approaches work. Um, as Kim mentioned, you really need to consider the system as a whole and think about the crop uh, production period and how that matches nutrient availability and also think about temperature in the growing environment too, especially uh, given the fact that, um, that microbes are important for making organic fertilizers plant available. Uh, many growers um, are successful with the, uh, when they begin with substrate incorporated organic fertilizers as their base feed and then they um, amend from there, either using a liquid organic as needed or doing occasional top dressing um, after uh, four or six weeks when their initial nutrient charge runs out. We found that conventional growers can see some benefits as well using organic fertilizers, not to switch to certified organic production, but just because they work as a controlled release alternative, um, as well as the combination organic and mineral fertilizers um, can work to increase microbial activity and reduce nutrient release leaching as well. So with that, I want to thank all of you for listening. And those that can stick around, Kim and I will, will stay on and we'll um, answer any questions that come up. All right. Um, let me unmute Kim here. Just one second here. OK. Um, everything is, uh, Kim and, and Neil, you both um, can talk. Um, Let's see, we had a, a, a question. Let me see. So Kim, did you analyze the leachate from the containers fertilized with the feather meal that had a high EC? Yeah, we did. Um, I can email, I can email the, the graphs of those various nutrient release uh, curve to, let's see, who asked that question? Uh, it was Doug Bailey. Hi, Doug. Yeah, I'll just I'll send an email with that information. Okay. Um, let's see. So, um, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, scrolling through these to, to see. Um, can vermicompost be used as a top dress? Yep, yep, we've successfully used it as a top dress. 
um, I found we've had to apply it about every three or four weeks um, because it, uh, most of the nutrients get used up within that three to four week period of time. Okay, a question is, is uh, NH4 or ammonium taken up by the, the plant directly? Yeah, it is. It, it is. Yep. And one cool thing uh, to, to understand about ammonium versus nitrate uptake and assimilation by the plant is that most species can readily store nitrate in the vacuoles of their, their cells, whereas ammonium has to be immediately assimilated into amino acids and proteins and then enzymes. So what that translates is to is that if ammonium is oversupplied, there can be some problems with ammonium toxicity. And that's one of the reasons we sometimes have to be careful with oversupplying ammonium when uh, temperatures are really cool because um, you have uh, microbial activity unable, just not acting very fast, and unable to convert the ammonium to nitrate in the substrate. So ammonium and nitrate, uh, nitrogen nutrition is actually a really interesting aspect of the organic and conventional fertilizer use. All right. Uh, um, th there's a comment, not so much a, a question, but maybe um, Kim or Neil, you can um, elaborate on it. But uh, um, there's a comment about a, a challenge finding a, a, a organic fertilizer that's soluble enough to use through um, drip tape or some other any other kind of automatic irrigation. Did right, and I've I've used um, the various liquids that I mentioned today. I've used them all through drip systems. Um, one of the things that we'll typically do is um, is not uh, is is to flush them out after we use them, so to run some just clear water through the line. And I think in our case that helps to prevent kind of accumulation of of nutrients as well as maybe um, then you're not leaving the fertilizer behind in the drip line for um, for uh, microbes to grow in. All right. Are there any reduced oxygen levels inside the soil due to decomposition or nitrification? Um, I've not noticed any problems with that um, in containers, um, especially using a substrate that has good aeration. Um, there's, there's plenty of oxygen provided that way. Um, where I've had more difficulty, I've tried using um, liquid organic materials in a, like a hydroponic pond, and, and I found that some of the materials that I use, is sort of like there's a lot of um, food source for microbes, and I actually see kind of biofilms that grow very quickly um, and reduced oxygen levels in those hydroponic ponds. Yeah, and I can certainly confirm Neil's observations. Um, we measured dissolved oxygen in organic hydroponic production systems and with some organic nutrient sources did see a reduced DO levels to the point of, of concern, to the point that uh, growth of the plants might be affected. But in our substrate systems, especially because we're using the soilless substrates that are engineered to have lots of uh, porosity and airspace, I don't believe we've ever noted anything, though we haven't measured it um, in substrates, but we really haven't ever noted any impact on growth that we would attribute to uh, reduced oxygen. OK. Um, I, another kind of common question is, uh, Neil, you mentioned using uh, both organic and inorganic fertilizers in combination. Um, and what, what purpose is that? that um, serve for the grower, um, it seems like it would be counterproductive if they're trying to be certified organic. Right. And here I'm not thinking of a certified organic grower using um, an inorganic material, um, but I'm thinking of for conventional growers, um, there are still benefits of using um, organic-based fertilizers. Um, one of the benefits that we see is with the granular fertilizers, it's just that they're a slow-release fertilizer source, um, and so they can reduce nutrient leaching uh, from your containers, uh, which could be good environmentally. Um, it, it depends on the product and the rate that you use, though. Uh, one of the benefits that we see is that if you can rely on, that on your base feed, it can reduce your need for um, using the fertilizer injector with your conventional fertilizer. And then finally, it's... Um, uh, 
theoretically you can get better uh, microbial activity. So you, with the with the conventional plus organic at the same time, you've got the organic fertilizer as your food source for beneficial microbes to grow and develop in the container. Um, and I do think uh, that area uh, could use more research to validate that. But um, ideally, you have a healthy microbial community growing in the container, and that's going to help suppress um, disease pathogens from growing. All right. <clears throat> With a, a product like um, EcoVita, um, what's the, the shelf life um, like that if it's being um, incorporated into a, a, a bark peat mix? I'll, I'll tell people that they should use their, their substrate incorporated fertilizers, whether it's Osmocote or, uh, or a granular organic, um, within a week or so of um, mixing it into your potting mix. Um, because the longer residence time it has before you use it, there is going to be nutrient release from the material. And then, in a sense, that's kind of wasted nutrients that won't, that could leach out and not get to your plant. And that goes the same for sustain as well? Right. Yep. Yep. Same for sustain as well. Um, and Kim talked about high salt issues with um, really high application rates of materials. And that could be an issue too with a longer residence time in your potting mix before using it is um, those nutrients are going to get released and those are going to be, those are going to add to the EC or the salts in the mix. Is there any organic fertilizers sources that are work better for hydroponics? Yeah, Kim, you've worked more with um, organic hydroponics. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's a bit of a challenge to use orga liquid organic fertilizers um, in hydroponic production for a number of reasons. And you know, a key is going to be that the organic, the liquid organic nutrient source doesn't have a lot of um, extra salts in it, sort of along for the ride. Like sodium, for example, that are going to build the salt level without contributing useful or essential nutrients to the plant, and that's certainly one thing that that we've we've noted. So, um, so that's really the first the first major and important question that I would would get answered with regard to which uh, liquid solubles I'd consider using because they're they're really affecting the EC in very different ways than we're used to with our conventional inorganic nutrient sources where everything that we put in on the conventional side is going to be essential nutrient. Um, certainly not true with organic. Okay, well I think that um, is the end of the questions that I see. So um, Finally, I'd, I'd like to thank once again BioWorks for their sponsorship of this webinar through eGrow. As I mentioned before, sponsorship from, from um, companies like BioWorks are, are what makes these webinars possible to bring them to you um, free of charge. So if you get the chance, please thank BioWorks um, when you see them at trade shows or um, just around in the industry. Um, and Certainly, um, last but not least, I want to thank Neil and Kim from Cornell and Kansas State for taking their time to um, be presenters in this eGrow webinar.